New day, new goals, let's own it. A beautiful day in Manhattan, and we got a new episode of Leaders Create Leaders. And in this episode, we're gonna get into the epitome of the power couple. I mean, these two individuals are literally taking their dream being personal trainers into building a fitness empire. Their company now, Sweat, has now got over 30 million users and on track to do 100 million in revenue this year. But they're all doing it while having that balance and really being an amazing relationship, getting engaged. So I want to get into the untold story of the one and only Kayla Itziness and Toby Pierce. Thank you so much for coming on Leaders Create Leaders. I'm gonna be so excited. Kayla, you're remarkable. I've been doing all this research and following you and just seeing the entire journey. And like, and I feel like what you and, and, and Toby have created in such a short amount of time is just like unbelievable in the past four years. And, and, and Toby, I must say, the, the, the proposal and the engagement ring is just like <laughs> unbelievable, beautiful. So congratulations on the engagement. Thanks, man. Um, and it's really nice to see a, a couple come together and, you know, really share a vision and be out there and going out there and inspiring the world. Thank you. That's so nice. You guys are both such huge influencers now in the space of fitness and business. And we'll get into the, all the success that you've had, which is unbelievable. Um, but like, who, like who, who were you growing up? How did you like really find yourself and were you always into fitness? And For me, I was always into fitness and growing up I had a really, really supportive family. Anything I did, even if I got like a bad grade, my mom's like, you did, like you did your best. It's like, we didn't grow up with money, we didn't grow up with anything. My mom just gave us a lot of love. Yeah. And she's like, you know what, if you're doing your best and I can see that you're doing your best and I will support you in everything that you do. Um, so we had a lot of love. Uh, my dad was a big, like, well, both my parents were really into sports, so my dad was like a soccer player, my mum played softball, um, not professionally, they right. just played it and they just loved it. Um, so they really encouraged us to, to play sport, both me and my sister. And um, yeah, so I grew up loving sport, loving fitness, um, never struggled with my, with my body image or anything like that. My mum never spoke poorly of her body. I grew up like loving my body and um, eating great food, Mediterranean diets and yeah. And uh, so did you think that that was like, did you realize that that was like a passion of yours that you kind of wanted to pursue or was it just more so Always. innate in your, in your family and you just looked at it more as a hobby? Like, did you actually struggle growing up saying like, I don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up? Like, did you, did you have that vision? No, I, the only thing I ever said was I want to do something to do with sport. Like I want to do something to do with sport. And that's all I said. And I said, I don't know what I want to be because I want to just do something with sport. My mom said, unless you're a professional athlete, I can't see uh, like a sporting career, like, I don't, I don't understand. I'm so, like, what about a PE teacher? And she's like, well, that sounds fantastic. My mum and my dad are both teachers, mm. so I was like, okay, well, I'll do a PE teaching. Like, that's what I'll do. So I had that in my head. As soon as I got into personal training, I was like, this is what I want. This is, this is it. I'm done. Wow. So yeah, and Toby was a little bit different. Yeah, mine was a lot different. Yeah, so I like, yeah, like I said, I grew up in a really small town. My where I went to school was like nearly an hour drive away sort of thing. So it was yeah, early mornings, like late nights going, you know, sort of to and from school. And uh, I was sort of like into fitness a little bit as a kid, I played sport and whatever, but I was actually into music like growing through high school. So I like played piano quite seriously. I was a bit of a, I don't know, a music nerd, like if you want to sort of think of it that way. And um, <laughs> yeah, so I like studied like classical music for like the better part of the first sort of 17 years of my life. And it wasn't, wow. um, it wasn't sort of, yeah, I was like that two year old kid on the piano sort of banging the keys sort of thing. That was me. But I, um, do you play the piano for Kayla? Oh, yes. sometimes. Yes. Yeah. So yes. No, he's so good. Yeah. Honestly, amazing. we're going to send you through some videos. He's absolutely yeah. incredible. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. But, uh, and then, so I didn't really get into, I guess, yeah, fitness probably until you know, I sort of finished high school. Like I, I thought, well, actually, yeah. So when I finished high school, I would have weighed, I'm trying to think in American weight in pounds, I probably would have weighed like 110, 115 pounds. Yeah, so I was like really, really, wow. really small. Um, and uh, I hurt my back 
uh, playing like uh, Aussie rules football and then so so went to a physio and the physio was like oh basically like in you know polite terms like you need to lift some weight and kind of not be so small and weak <laughs> but um so yeah I, I sort of started working at a gym and became friends with uh, a few people like that are quite sort of influential in you know the sports space and whatever in Australia and um that like motivated me to train more and then sort of the more I trained the more I kind of I guess became in love with the you know, the notion of like you know feeling good and like I guess uh, obviously, yeah, having always been like sort of the yeah, skinny sort of nerd figure, it was nice sort of being confident. Um, so yeah, the confidence that came with the training really motivated me to train more. And um, I was uh, working at a piano store, like selling pianos and sheet music and whatever. And um, yeah, as I sort of got better at the gym, I was like, oh, well, I'm gonna go to university to do, uh, I was doing a double degree in commerce and law, but I couldn't like work full time and sort of study at the same time. So I was like, oh, well, what alternatives do I have, you know, for work? And it was kind of like, oh, well, you know, I'm into the gym now. You know, how hard could personal training be? You know, I've got some friends who do it who make all right money and, you know, I could work early in the morning and late at night and do uni in the middle of the day. Um, so, yeah, I went down that path and that was kind of how I got into personal training. But what ended up happening was that I kind of fell in love with that so much that, like, took over my life and then the university kind of took a bit of a back seat and then I didn't end up, yeah, I didn't end up finishing it. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, so I ended up um, dropping out or deferring, I guess. Yeah, we both deferred, let's say Yeah, that. deferred. We deferred. <laughs> yeah, we go with defer, yeah. Obviously, you had the loving parents that believed in you and that instilled in you to dream big, but, I mean, was it hard for you to see the vision of where you, how far you've come? <laughs> yeah. It was more a means to yeah. an end, I think. At least for me, anyway, it was more of a means to an end. Because, like, like I said earlier, I was my whole thing was about like, oh, because well, my, my parents and especially my mum were really about like, oh, you've got to have a degree. If you want to do well in life, you've got to have a degree and you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's mm. like in, in, many, in many ways, it's, it certainly helps to generate a career and whatever, obviously if you have qualifications, yeah. but that was like a thing. So for me, you know, getting into you know, personal training was actually just a convenience to kind of you know, make money like while I was at university. Like I wasn't living at home. I left home when I was very young. So for me, it was like, oh, well, yeah, I've got to eat right yeah so i need to make some money while i can study um and yeah so at that point in time it was never yeah the goal was never ever to build this you know business or or empire a, attempt to create an empire yeah like that and doing it happily so so how did you mm. how did you both meet was it was it well where do you training? think we don't tell I'm thinking, you yeah. i'm thinking it's where, a gym right think? yeah yeah and what was, was that moment like um well we met at the we met at the gym and then I'm sure we, a lot of guys probably just come up to you at the gym. No, so that, that actually hadn't happened before. Oh. So I thought Toby was playing a joke on me because I thought like Toby was very good looking. And I was like, why is this person trying to talk to me? Like he's obviously, him and his friends are obviously having a laugh. <laughs> like I'm wearing no makeup. Like I look terrible. Like that's just like the things that are running through my head. And then I saw him again at a shopping center and he was like, oh, hey, do you want to go to lunch? Um, oh, yeah, this was good. This is not good. <laughs> so he's like, do you want to go to lunch? I was like, yeah, okay, sure. And I was thinking, okay, we'll go somewhere nice. Or like, not, I had no expectations, but he took me to the food court. And that's fine. I was like, awesome, we're going to the food court. Just humble. You know? Humble, yeah. yeah. But then he takes out his own meal that he's made. No, <laughs> that's a great. <laughs> that's great. It's chicken and rice, man. Like I was early on, like you know, in the gym bulking season. Like He's know. making a point. You know? yeah. He's, he's like, a yeah. disciplined man. He started eating this chicken yeah. and rice and I was just looking I actually, at Actually, from memory, I actually had and one. And you didn't bring her any chicken and rice? Wow, well, yeah, this was, that was my one mistake. And I also like, I remember I had like in my bag, I had my own small like portable bottle of sauce. So I'm like pouring my sauce like on my <laughs> chicken and rice in the middle of a shopping center. <laughs> <laughs> so wow yeah. so that's the trick and i just that's literally thought mm. you... it's a secret sauce secret yeah, sauce yeah, yeah. Secret yeah. Sauce, yeah. So i just thought like what am i doing here listening to this guy talk about and toby had all these dreams and i'm telling you every single thing he said that day has come true wow. he's like i want to do this i want to be this I'm like i never had this growing up and i want to have this and i just thought like that's really nice but in my head i sort of I like to be honest, I doubted him a little bit. Like mm -hmm. this guy who's just brought out this like chicken and rice, who's like that like, can't afford to buy a meal from the food court. Like has to right. bring a like, and he was ten year old t-shirt oh, with like holes in it. Yeah, and, like I'm just thinking, stuff, yeah. are you are you gonna be able to do that? But for some reason, just like believe that. I was like, okay, like I believe you. For some reason, I believe you. Now that they both met, how did they actually take this passion for fitness and turn it into a booming business? It, what I really love about Toby and Kayla's relationship is. 
it's the literally it's like the epitome of empowerment they empower each other they understand each other they really you know understand each other's strengths and it seems like Toby really takes hold of the business while Kayla really does the front end building this massive community of women globally but we're gonna get into how did they actually learn how to scale from going doing these boot camp events where they're making no money to globally doing events and building a business that generated millions of dollars but all not before they made a huge mistake. Could you tell me the journey. Like, how did this happen? Like the biz, uh, and not thinking about like how. Nearly six years ago, we started. So yeah, at the end of this year, or yeah. a couple of months, it'll be six years. I guess we've been like dating or together or whatever. Um, and I guess so because yeah, we when we met in the gym or whatever, we were both doing personal training at that moment right. in time. Um, the, the, Kayla was doing like a lot of stuff like on the road at people's houses or like in a little sort of basically a shed at the back of her parents' house, which was converted to like a studio. That's cool. But um, were you creating content at that time? I'm just curious. No, this was, no, this no was before content. that even existed. Wait, honestly, so, like, I honestly trained yeah. my clients in my backyard. My clients still said to me like, dude, you used to train us on your grass. That's cool. In your mm. backyard. <laughs> so this was before Instagram like was a thing, man. So right. like, because literally shortly after- It's crazy after, to think how far it's come. You're like six years. You're yeah. like, you would think that when you would say that before Instagram became a thing, Instagram's like everything in people's day-to-day -day lives now. Yeah, so imagine kids, like, kids don't understand. That. It was like when it was, I don't know if you, you know if you remember when it was like brown and blue. Like that's how old Instagram was wow. then. Like the interface was brown and blue. Like yeah. that's just like scary. But like, yeah. but like it was literally, so we, when we were running our businesses then, like it was just like really early on, like literally when it was sort of ads were only really starting on Facebook, like even so. And we'd been using, you know, both of those channels kind of to, we didn't really know anything about anything, but it was like, oh, well, if we post it, people will see it and then that'll work, right? And then it kind of did in some ways. So like we had, you know, I had boot camps, like outdoor boot camps, women that I was running. You, you were starting to do boot camps, right? Yeah, and then, so then Kayla had her studio and then we were kind of, I guess, like teaming up, you know, so I'd, I'd help her with bits and pieces of like business stuff and then she'd come and run some classes, you know, with you know, me and um, the other trainers that we had working. And that was probably like a really, the real early on, like when we only really first started to actually work together. So we've been dating and been together for a while, but then that was really when that sort of started to happen. But uh, how did the chemistry work? I mean, it's a lot of times you, you, mm. know, you hear of couples that they, they separate, they have mm. to like separate the two business, business and, and yeah. We are like two different, like very different um, people in terms of business. Like I am really focused on like the community. I'm a trainer. Like I do the boot camps. Like mm. I connect with women. I mean, Toby does as well, but Toby is, like Toby's the CEO, he's got the staff members, he's got the business, he's got the, he's got the visions. I have visions too, but he'll make them come to life. Mm. Whereas I, I, I'm one of those people that I'm like, I want to do this and Toby will be like, that's a great idea. This is how, how we do we it. Execute. And so we like play to our strengths. Mm. So, and I- We've never yeah. really like, yeah. And I, I guess like we never really actually even had to have that conversation. It was never like, I'm going to do this. Like you're going to do that. It just kind of like, I don't know, it kind of worked and yeah. happened. And again, like it's a trust thing, like, you know, obviously in a relationship no different to a business partnership or a relationship of any kind like if you don't have the trust it just doesn't work and you know I can trust her to go do her thing on social or you know like run a fitness class with a few thousand people you know the same way that she can trust me to you know deliver on what needs to happen behind the scenes for that yeah the trust is so. everything mm. so fast forward um you have these boot camps that have, are now serving I mean you had one in New York that was over four thousand mm. You know, people, you were mentioning to me, it's like a lot, it definitely yeah. is a lot of burpees. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you're doing those all over the world, to my understanding. Yeah. You also have leveraged technology. You've, mm -hmm. you know, on two sides, one, building your community. I mean, I, correct me, I don't know the numbers. I'll tell my head between Facebook and Instagram, it's like well over 10 cross, million, we'll right? Across over all the accounts, it's more than 35 million more now. More than 35 million, which mm -hmm. is out of control. So I kind of want to understand how that happened, how that virality happened. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get into... You know, you, you leverage technology to launch your own app, you know, called Sweat. Mm -hmm. And you have over 30 million users with the app. It's on track to do 100 million in revenue this year, which is unbelievable. Um, it's really f remarkable. But talk to me a little bit about the beginning stages of building that community. I'm assuming that that was kind of like the beginning of really learning how to scale this was when you started actually creating content, putting it, yeah. leveraging that. The what little that? boot camps was, like? was, I guess, that and 
the studios, I think, were probably where it really began. Because like, cause when Instagram first came out, it was like, I remember I actually like watched one of the videos the other day and it's like tragic. It's at the so time, funny. at the time we thought it was like, we're like, oh, like this is like a, this is the most amazing video like advert ever. But, you know, we, we were putting together short videos of like, our, you know, boot camp sessions or like, a, you know, transformation photos of Kayla's clients and such on a few different channels. And, um, yeah, it just seemed to work really well. And like, we didn't actually have the idea to do the online business and it was more sort of that people were requesting like, you know, in different states or even like over here in America, like, you know, we want to like work out the way that you do sort of thing. Um, but it wasn't really like possible. God, we made an e we made eBooks um, for, the, for the women uh, all around the world. And we, Toby built a website, a really, 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 I'm going to be honest, so it was tragic. a really bad website. <laughs> yeah, at that moment in time, like, that just uh, goes to show, like, oh, yeah, it's like, if you look back, like, 10 years ago, you know, your first piece of content you create, like, at that moment in time, like, you feel, like, so good, and it's in, like, iMovie, using, like, the standard transitions, and, like, mm -hmm. the three fonts that you can use, and then, mm -hmm. Fast forward 10 years later and you look back and you're like, what was I thinking? Yeah. Like, That's why it's so important to start. I mean, I was looking yeah. back at like our first episode of this show mm. and like how far we've come now. And it's, mm. I feel like that's why you just gotta like put yeah. it out there. Start. Yeah, so we did. So we, so we put this ebook out there on this website that by the way, we had to do a video on how to use the website because it was so confusing. We had to be like, hi guys, this is how you use the website. Anyway, women still found the ebook somehow on this website <laughs> and purchased it and loved it. Um, started sending in the transformations and grew through word of mouth. So this was very like beginning of January in 2014. So like we'd been together for a year and a half or, or nearly two years at that point in time and we'd kind of, um, I think we'd, yeah, we'd like just moved in together like a few months prior, like in our own house, like started renting our own house sort of thing. And uh, yeah, so we, we, I guess we, we launched the ebooks online. And then, um, I mean, at that point in time, like literally only about a month or two after that, we were kind of sort of thinking like, oh, wow, this really, you know, this is just doing really great. Yeah. Like way more, like way, way sort of bigger already than we ever expected. Right. Um, yeah, and like, so like, yeah, I guess me and like the way that I think was always like, oh, well, you know, like we're really, we have a really good opportunity here. And you know, keeping in mind, I was still doing a double degree at uni, Kayla was still working full time as a personal trainer, I was still working full time as a personal trainer and we had this thing going on online and um, yeah it wasn't until like you know, six months later sort of thing that we were like yeah I guess yeah probably killing it you know, in terms of what you know, sort of people would view but we were kind of still like thinking along the lines of like oh well maybe you know, maybe this won't be here one day so we need to how do we improve it you know, how do we make it better how do we get how do we bring more people together and you know for for the sake of improving their health you know through using this content or other content and so you know then i kind of began this oh well we can extend the ebook or you know we could do different ebooks with the food content we can do this 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 and this sort of thing and then so yeah a team of three or four people in the spare bedroom that's like this big like really a blur from then it's like yeah we launched the beginning of that year in 2014 you know bang, 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 more content by the end of the year, sort of three or four times as much content as we launched with. And then early in 2015, we kind of, watch it was sorry, the end of 2014, we ran our first like actual boot camp, like for the business, which had like 50 people or 60 people. And we thought that was like big. We we're like, whoa, this is like massive. And we, so yeah, we did that just to raise some money. But then we did that, people were like, were really in love with that. And then so like, we sort of came back from that. And I was like, oh, I was like, imagine if we kind of did like a global fitness tour, like sort of half sarcastic, but then, people agreed with me and I was like, so then like we had to like actually go and deliver on it. Like, so um, yeah, then so it was literally like, literally from that moment and then at the very beginning of 2015 and like three or four months later, we'd done, yeah, we'd toured all of Australia, we'd done uh, Amsterdam, two in London, one in New York and we'd run all these events and like we sort of, we'd post about it and I think we, I think with the first time we did the one in London, it was like 15 minutes and we had 3,000 registrations. No way. And we were like, this is like crazy, like this. And it, how be. big was the following at that point? Yeah. So the ebook for what? A hundred thousand. One hundred and fifty thousand fans when we launched the ebooks on Instagram and didn't even have a Facebook account. And then by the end of that year, it was like over a million. Like it just went crazy, like literally, yeah, like ten x growth that year. And then I guess like at that point, you know, we kind of. Because again, like this is when Instagram was still really young, so like growth on Instagram was a little bit easier. And then yeah. sort of, but as it started to get harder, like strangely, we still kind of just like kept the momentum going through doing yeah more events and expanding and whatever. And um, it's interesting how much the live events was so critical to the growth. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. like you know, I want to ask, like, well, what were some what are some tips that you have for you know to mm. to growing that you know from a viral mm. perspective and content perspective, you know, for people who want to build a following, well, like, but it's interesting how that... Like, our boot camps are free. 
Like our boot camps were. Yeah, our strategy free. was like ultra, like unconventional, and like I guess we we never really like run the business or like the the marketing strategy like purely for the purpose of getting more fans. And like I think um, I think like I mean we spoke earlier about like you know the all the stuff that you focus on is all like being like high quality, like not mm-hmm. just like pumping out like content. We were kind of focused about you know more from a strategical standpoint. You know, how do we actually get people to like what we do? rather than just how to get more fans. Because, you know, how often do you see online people with like lots of fans or whatever, but they don't actually, they don't do anything meaningful with it. Mm-hmm. And we were like, oh, well, rather than just get all the fans, let's do something meaningful and focus on being meaningful. Hence, free events, like literally, you know, like thousands, like tens of thousands of women around the world going to free fitness events that, you know, doesn't really happen anywhere else. Cost us a lot of money, obviously, but the thing was it meant that we then were able to gen- generate like a, a real relationship with our consumers. So it's not, yeah, you have a million fans. It's like, but do they actually like you and do they yep. follow you because they're engaged with you and what you're doing and your purpose right. rather than just like, you're a good looking person and you do funny stuff. So I'm going to follow you sort of right. thing. So, right. Wow. Yeah. So what was the moment that, did you have like any one moment or was it more than one moment where like you knew that you were making real impact, that you were like living your dream, that you were like quitting everything else, mm. going all in, but... I mean, and, and at the same time, you're creating such physical transformation in people. Mm. You know, what was like a moment for you, Kayla, that like you felt like, wow, like this is my gift and I'm sharing it with the world and I'm making real impact and change in these people's lives and, mm. and like you felt blessed for that. Um, well, the first moment that I was like, like my first like crying moment was like, so we worked with the radio stations all over Australia to do the boot camp. And then we finally sort of broke, fr- not broke free, not gonna say that like that, but we we did it by ourselves, and we held a boot camp in London. And so we we did the we did the ticket sales and whatever, and because it's a free event, you don't know like people buy buy the tickets and they might not show up. So I had no idea how many people were coming in. I was sitting in this green room in London, and the girls were saying, you know, there's a few people there. They didn't want to like get me too riled up, and um, I was like, okay. So in my head, I'm like, oh god, there's gonna be like 200 girls there. I mean, that's a lot, but we were like, I wanted like a lot of girls there and, like, and for our first boot camp, I didn't want to feel like we tried to do it, but then we couldn't without the radio station. So then anyway, they're like, three, two, one, you're going to open the doors and you're going to walk through the crowd. I was like, okay. So three, two, one, open the doors. And I was like, oh my God, you actually can't, I actually can't explain it. It was like, hit me in the chest. There was 2000 girls there. The whole room was full. There was like a laneway that they had made for me to walk down. I was walking down this like lump, just like, like you get a lump in your throat when you're yeah. about to cry. So I was like, about to cry. I look behind me, my team's already crying. So then like, they've <laughs> already started crying. It was so, so funny. I do remember that. There's like two girls like running down behind you with like, filming their love. Like, yeah, they were <laughs> crying. And then the line started crying. The girls in the line started crying. I think they saw me getting upset. And so by the time I got to the front of the stage, I literally, and I looked down, I was like, please, everybody stop crying. Everyone was <laughs> crying. And then when I got off the stage, um, I went to the back room and I lay on the floor and I started crying and only because we had done the meet and greet, like all the stories from girls from another part of the world and how I've changed their life, it was just so nice. And so that was sort of the moment that I was like, wow, I've actually done something really cool here. Wow. So at what point did you, you're doing, you complete this world tour and then was it during that, that it seems like you're a visionary. I feel like I connect with you in the sense of like, you're always thinking big. You're always mm-hmm. thinking bigger. Always. So what was the moment where you were like, okay, we got thousands of people, what's next? And what mm-hmm. was that what was that moment like? And then that did that mm-hmm. is that what the inspiration was for Sweat? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm actually like Toby said this in two thousand and what? Well, so we actually so we we launched Kayla's very first ebook in January two thousand and fourteen. Um, and yeah, you know, obviously, like whenever something first comes out, there's lots of sales, and then it drops down, and yeah, you know, it goes flat. And then the the trick is to try and keep it going, obviously, right? And it was probably like about literally only three or four weeks after we launched that, um, I was kind of like, oh, like this is like pretty cool. I think I can figure this out, and we can kind of, you know, this is the economics of the business, and this is how we make it work, and so on and so forth. And I was kind of sitting there, and I was like, oh, like the feedback from people is really good. Like they like genuinely like our product, and like I'd been a personal trainer for a few years at this point anyway, and like. Yeah, so in the notion of like thinking big, like you know, some of the first thoughts are always like, oh, like what's bad about this? Or like what's wrong with this? Or yeah, I like, it. yeah, like, and I have like my own sort of philosophy on business and decision making and whatever. And like, there's a whole, you know, certain pillars of decision making that I have. And one of those pillars is effectively, or two, like scalability and sustainability. And I was sort of looking at like, well, 
you know, we could do this for 10 years, like easy, no worries. It's like, okay, but how do we do it for 30? And you're know, like, we could get this to, you know, maybe to reach like a few million women or whatever. It's like, how do we get to reach a hundred million women? How do we get to reach half a billion women? Wow. Like, you know, how do, how do we do that? Um, and you obviously like really early on, like, you know, they're all like awesome numbers to work with and whatever. But then when you actually start to kind of look at that and extrapolate and be like, well, what's actually a realistic solution? Yeah, my solution at this point in time was basically like, well, we need to, ha- we need to create a fitness product that can add value to every woman on the planet, period. And then so it was about figuring out, well, not every, you know, the first thing was basically not every woman in the world wants to do our workout program. Yeah, so okay, we need a solution to have more workout programs and then not everyone wants to eat that way. So we have to have a solution to allow them to eat all of these ways and not everyone wants to, not everyone lives in this country. So how do we get to that country? Not everyone speaks this language. How do we get to that language? And so you can see this is all these different like areas of stuff that we had to cover off. And then so, you know, after I guess having like, you know, I kind of had this idea and I wrote this business plan and kind of got it and just sort of put it in a drawer. And I was like, oh, one day, you know, sort of one day I'll come back to it. And then obviously, you know, 18 months later, we're doing what we're doing and we're sort of like all of a sudden, like it's, it's a thing and like it's working or whatever. And I was like, wow, we have a, you know, we actually have like a, a genuine like chance to really give that a crack. Like, you know, it's either, yeah, and I don't, I don't really, you know, one of my things is obviously you want to go 150% at everything. You don't kind of go half fast to do stuff. So I was like, well, let's do it. Like, let's have a genuine crack at it. And so this was sort of like the next like big, you know, the next like really big like transition for the business was, well, like, you know, if we want to get there, like we need to have a platform that can hold all that content. So we have to have an app. Yeah, so let's let's do that with the brand that we're running now, which was Kayla's brand. Let's figure that out. Let's try and work it and it'll be easy, of course, and then we'll do it and then, you know, <laughs> off we go. So, you know, we'd kind of come up with the fact that we wanted to call the business Sweat when we got there, you know, so we launched the app for Kayla, which was, you know, well, we'll sweat with Kayla, right? So we got all the content, you know, and this was like, this is where stuff got like really quite like savage. It was like, you know, we've filmed the content. Oh, well, we've never really filmed any content before. Oh, we've got a green screen. Oh, okay, we've never done green screening before. We need to build an app. Oh, I can't code. Okay, right. yeah, like, so it's like instantly like, yeah, our learning curve and like, yeah, especially my learning curve from like a leadership point of view just literally goes like vertical. Like you can't hire a whole bunch of software engineers unless you can kind of speak their language to tell them what to do. Like, you know, and you can't get what you want out of a video production team unless you can communicate what you want from them. So, yeah, we went through this and, you know, we, we spent six months and like over half a million dollars like building an app, which was meant to cost us 200 grand. Wow. And we got six months in and I'd kind of entrusted like, you know, a particular person to like run that project and like it just didn't work like outright. Like, so we literally just spent like half a million bucks, oh like God. see it like gone. And so then I got to a certain point, I was like, all right, like I need to like, I need to level up. Like I need to level up personally like this. And yeah, so literally went so away. So the robot learned yeah. everything. So That's like, what we call him, the robot. So he went and learned every single department in the business that we needed to be the, he was the best. And he was able, he said to, I want to be able to walk into any department and know what I'm saying and know what I'm doing. So he went and studied and did that. And I'm mm-hmm. so proud of you for that. You continue your story, but I just have to like, I have to put that out there. Yeah, so I mean, uh, like I said, like, yeah, as a being part of like being a leader or whatever, like, you know, I can't have a conversation about like how to build a product if I don't understand software engineering, like talking about, you know, APIs, infrastructure, like software architecture and so on and so forth. I can't, you know, have conversations about like how to get the video content and whatever if I don't understand like content management systems and such. So, you know, basically got a degree in Googling, you know, went to, <laughs> you know did my Googling. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So important. So we were six months in and we'd already lost like half a million bucks. Like that wasn't coming back because we basically threw that out and like started again on that day. Yeah. Meanwhile, we'd been working towards this launch date of like November and we're like, you know, sort of in July, June, July. And we're like, all right, well, we're going to start from scratch and like, we're going to do it again. And then anyway, so we, we did a plan basically. And then like literally in like seven weeks had achieved, you know, like 10 times as much as what we'd achieved in the previous six months. Like, and it had cost us less because it was less time, but we sort of started from scratch and then we were, you know, we got like really close to the launch day and then we were like, oh, well, we've announced this mistake. Number two, you never announce a launch date if the product's not finished. Yeah. And, uh, so we were like, yeah, literally 24 hours a day, sort of seven days a week, like, you know, in a room, like working on this and, um, long like ultra long story short basically you know we spent like nearly a million bucks building something that was supposed to cost like two hundred thousand dollars um you know and uh, at this point in time we were you know like killing it and making really good money at that point in time and we're like all right we're going to launch the app like you know done all the risk calculations and forecasts and whatever like it's going to be all good like launch the app bang twenty five thousand complaints in the first day 
See, the beauty of software is like you can iterate really fast, right? So like, yeah, you know, we did that and then seven days later, you know, we relaunched like an updated version of the app, like complaints pretty much like stopped, like, you know, 60,000 signups like that day, like bang. And then, you know, we'd, so we we made 80% less money in that month than we had like for the previous like six months or whatever, like, you know, product was better, but we still like weren't making any money. And so like, you know, business is like going like way backwards sort of thing. And um, and this is just another one of those moments. Right. I was like, all right, like I need to get in the bandwagon and like learn again. So it was all about figuring out how to make that work pretty much. And then sort of four weeks later, like, you know, a few more versions of the app later, like it sort of started to pick up and whatever. And then like all of a sudden we were, you know, number one health and fitness app, 142 countries, like most downloaded, like most paying users, like highest earning and whatever. And it just sort of started to like really like ramp up, you know, Six months later, business is twice the size. Six months later, again, business is twice the size again. You know, finally got to a spot where we kind of understood enough about software, and then, you know, then came Sweat. So found some more trainers to work with, like some really amazing women in different training styles. Created their content. This time, we got it right the first time because we'd been through that process of messing it up. So the first step wasn't Sweat. Then. No, no, it was just just with Kayla's content. So we converted it. So it was from, similar. But it was called Sweat with Kayla, but that's not yeah. what Sweat. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was Sweat into. with Kayla, yeah. and then with Kayla got it. And what yeah. was the business model? Well, our business model then was we'd gone from eBooks, obviously, which is like a single purchase service, into a subscription model. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and this was like part of the really you know steep learning curve. It's like that the like fundamentally. I mean, like too technical and whatever, but like the economics of a single purchase service business are like like completely different to that of a subscription right. model. You know, the user acquisition modeling and so on and so forth is like completely different. Um, and again, like, you know, this is probably one of those moments in time where I was like, oh, maybe if I hadn't have dropped out of university, I would really understand this. Uh, you know, <laughs> so it was kind of like the degree would have been handy then. All right, guys, so thank you for watching. Obviously, Kayla and Toby's story is super inspiring, but the thing that really, really inspired me the most was the fact that these two people found love and empowered each other to build their empire. So guys, if you love this video, please do me a favor, subscribe, share it with your friends, comment below, and uh, most importantly, remember, not everybody can be a great entrepreneur, but a great entrepreneur can come from anywhere. Peace. Guys, so if each one of these episodes resonates with you, the lifestyle, the impact, you know, just really like the the whole model that all these entrepreneurs represent, it's something that I think, you know, really helps them stand as a world-class leader. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to give you guys some extra value other than just watching these episodes. So I created a report and it's called The Map. It's basically a guide to give you and teach you how to create this influence, this impact, this income that a lot of the entrepreneurs and leaders that I bring on the show have. The MAP stands for monetizing your expertise, amplifying your message, and positioning your personal brand. It's free, all you guys gotta do is click the link in the description and we'll email it to you free of charge. And it's something that I wish I had when I first became a creator. So hopefully you guys enjoy and thanks for watching Leaders Create Leaders. Peace.